Good morning again for everybody, for, for the newcomers. And um, it, it will be, uh, the, the presentation will be in two parts. The first part is the extension of the model and uh, the, the language and how the, we go more and more into object-oriented language and the scalability and modular way of uh, programming your, uh, your application. And the second part will be using all of this from a server for, for uh, doing a web application. So it's, it's only a peek into the future. I mean, there are, there are a lot of things to, to talk about. And in only one hour and a half, we won't have time for everything. But it's to, 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 to explain a, a bit of what direction we are going uh, into. Uh, so, first part, uh, it, it also relies on the presentation from Laurent Eno on the classes in the, the language. But if you didn't see that presentation, you, you can still understand and so on. So, uh, one of the, the, the first extension of, of ORDA now is the ability to, to create your own um, uh, member function for the, the class you create out of your uh, tables and entities and entity selections. The idea is to really uh, help you create something more and more uh, component-oriented in, in a more modular way. So uh, as a very simple example, I, I'll start with something very simple. I have a small uh, uh, server running with um, with a structure like this. So I, I just imported and converted uh, uh, the US zip code uh, file, uh, which is public. And so here is a simple structure where for each zip uh, code, you, you get the, the related city, the county, and the state. And I want to create a, a small component that can be used on the network on any uh, computer uh, and will be used and reused by, by all my other applications. So it's a very, very simple one. Usually you, you do something more complex, but I, I wanted something very simple. So on my, on my uh, city uh, data class, on my city table, I have a, a data class that is connected. So here is the ID. In the classes, you get a class by the same name as the table. So you get the city uh, data class and it inherits from the base data class uh, class, actually, sorry for the, the name, but uh, which contains all the, the basic function of a data class like query, uh, save, and so on. And I can create my own, uh, own member function. So here, I wanted to do something like get a city by its uh, by its name. So here's a function to get the city by its name. Uh, I want to get all the cities uh, based on uh, on a token. I can do that. I, I, I won't go into full detail, but here is another example. If if I have an entity which is a, a city and from that city, I want to get the population. So it's quite simple. I will, so this here in that case it is an entity. I will use the, the relation zip. So if I, if I look at my, um, at my relation here, I have a, 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 a one to n relation called zips. So I activate this to get the, the selected uh, zip code for, for that city. And on that selection, I can do a sum of the population attribute, which is a number, and I get the population of a city. If I want to get all the zip code of a city as a string separated by comma, I can do the same thing. I, I activate the, the relation, the related uh, entities uh, relation. I, I take their ID and I do a join 
uh, with, uh, with the comma, and uh, I get a string out of the result. So based on this, I can use this locally, for example, in a method um, like this. Um, oh, there it is. a small method like this, where, for example, I can use the, the getCity member function uh, to get San Francisco. Out of this, I can get the, the zip codes. I can get the population. And I can do a, an alert where I say San Francisco has uh, that population, that many inhabitants, and with the following zip code. So, we can trace it to, to really understand what's going on. Okay, so first thing is I get my city entity, okay, so with that function. And that city has uh, a selection of zips, uh, as I said. So, for example, it has 24 uh, entities which are zip, which are related. So, here are all the zip codes from... Uh, and each of those zip codes has, uh, um, has uh, a county ID, a population, and so on. So, I can execute that function that we'll call get zip code. I get the, the zip codes. I can execute one that gets the population and I can get my result like this. So, nothing very fancy, but the good thing is that I'm using um, those functions as a, a kind of API to my uh, city management. I, I, I don't need to actually understand the way it is uh, internally structured. I, I, I can use the API to manipulate the, the information. So, the same thing is true if I, I do it from another uh, database. Uh, so, for, here is a second database which has nothing to do. It's, uh, it's my employee company uh, database that I use for all my examples. And in that, uh, I, I, I did a small method here which does exactly the same thing, it, but almost exactly the same thing. First thing is that it has to open the, the, the remote uh, component uh, using open data store. So it, it does an open data store, the, the address of uh, the, the host name of, of my data store, and the local ID city manager. I, I call it city manager because this is what I want. I intend to do with it. I want to to manage my uh, my, my stuff, and the the code here is exactly the same, except for this. If if you look back here in that code, I use DS, which is the 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 local data store, because now it's remote. I just have to replace this by. Uh, by this data store, which is open from, uh, from another uh, computer. Here it's the same computer, but usually you, you do that on, on, on another computer. And, and the code is exactly the same. And of course, I can use uh, that code in my, in my forms or AWF. So for example, it, it's a small very ugly form I did very quickly, but where I show all my company and I want to be able for a company to uh, entering a zip code get auto uh, automatically the, the city. So I can, in that button, do the same thing. Uh, here, in that case, I reopen the, the manager, but it actually it should be in a global uh, variable, so I don't have to redo it every time. It should be... Uh, factorized. And, but the, the real use is here. I, in my form, uh, in my company for the city, I use the city manager uh, on the data class city to get the city name from a zip code. 
And uh, same thing, I use the API. So I if I run this, and I, so I take any company and I, I enter a zip code like, uh, like this, for example, it gets done. So nothing fancy, but just to, to, to show you that you can um, work on your code in different components that can be shared among different uh, instances or different computers or virtual machine, whatever, a Docker uh, station. So it, it can be anywhere. And the only requirement is to access it through uh, the network by its address, which itself can be virtual. So you, if, if you use a, um, a load balancer, you, you cannot, or, or, or reverse DNS, you can automatically uh, rearrange the, the address of your different component on, on your network uh, easily. So, so that's, that's really very quick and so on. Based on, uh, on that, we also, so, so the, sorry, this is a, a very near future. This, this is going to be in, in the next R release uh, after this one. So it's very near future because it's, it's quite important to actually. Uh, so. Now, in, um, in also a near future, not as, as near, but almost as near, we also intend to extend the model to have a better control of, of how uh, information is handled, is um, optimized, and so on. So you, you, you have the ability to, to extend your model to create new type of attributes that you can uh, control, and events to actually control the way your data class uh, behave or your entity behaves and so on. Um, so I'll go back to that example. Let me just quit that so that I have one less window on screen. It will be easier. And if you look at, um, at this, I'll open the, um, sorry, I forgot to open. So I'll open the Okay, so my, my, my project is here. In the sources, I have the, the, the definition of, of the model, the, the catalog. And now you can have an extension to your, uh, to your model in, in the model.json file. And I'll just show this. Um, I don't know if you can see easily, but okay. So in my, so first, sorry, I, I should go back to the, so here's my employee table, company table. So out of that table, a data class employees is automatically uh, built and a, a data class company is built. And I want to extend for example, to, to create new kind of attributes. So I can extend it that way. Sorry. Uh, I, I want to create uh, an alias uh, for uh, the manager of the manager. So in my, in my structure here, between the employer ID, uh, sorry, between the manager ID and the ID of the employee, I have a, a recursive um, relation called manager. So each employee can be a manager of other uh, people. And the, the reverse uh, relation, the one to end relation, is called direct reports. So uh, I know who is working for a manager. So in my model, extension in my model extension i want the, something called boss which is a, a related entity which will be the manager of the manager so now in my data class i have a new attribute uh, boss which will automatically uh, be the manager of the manager 
I can also do an alias on, on a simple scalar value, for example, to flatten uh, uh, a table. Uh, I, I want in, uh, in my employee to have the company name, uh, so it could be the employer.name, employer being the company uh, based on the relation uh, uh, that is here. I have uh, between the employer ID and the company ID, I have, uh, oh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong. I have the employer uh, relation. And uh, if I want the co-workers, for example, so it, it's also easy, I can do, I can take the manager and from the manager uh, get the, the di direct report, so everybody working for a manager who is my manager are my, my co-workers automatically. And I can extend further, instead of aliases, I can have computed attribute, calculated attributes. So I will show that also with uh, the full name and the edge, for example, which will be calculated attribute, one which will be a string, one which will, which will be a number. I'll come back to the other extension. I, 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 I'll start with this very easy, very quickly. Uh, so if I if I create a, a small method to sorry, let me get rid of everything that was my test. So if if I take uh, an employee, for example, um, any employee, so by, by a key, for example, I take one, and I can automatically say dollar uh, amp2 is equal to dollar amp dot boss. So it will auto automatically give me the, the boss of, of that employee. And if I say uh, co-workers, oh, sorry. So here, if I if I look here, here's the the coworkers attribute and the boss attributes that I activate. So if I do something like this and run this, oh, uh, oh yeah, I forgot the get. <laughs> Sorry. So if I if I run something like this, then you can see that. Uh, my employee is here, and the, the co-workers is a selection of, so it has two co-workers, and the boss is there, it's it, that guy, and so on. And if I look here, the, the manager of the manager is, uh, is there. So, yeah, nothing very fancy, but it's very useful to, to be able to use aliases, because same thing, you, you can create an alias on any level of uh, relations, which can be very, very useful um, if you decide to later on create an intermediate table. So you can have um, a relation between a table A and B, simple. And then later on, you decide that instead of being a, a one to n relation, you want it to be an, a, a, a P to n relation. So you, you need to create an intermediate table. You create your intermediate tables, and you, you create an alias which has the same name as the initial relation, which was a one to n, and you call it, because you give it the same name, and the alias will be now from that initial relation to the intermediate table, and from the intermediate table to the, the destination table, then all your code remains the same. You don't have to change your code. The, the, your business logic doesn't change. 
So it, it, it is quite important uh, with aliases, you, you can extend and modify your, uh, your model without breaking uh, your code. Um, but it, it goes a bit further. It, it also automatically optimize for you. So let me give you a, an example. If I, if I do a query like this, uh, dollar selection is equal to ds dot uh, employee query. So I'll do something very st stupid, but for example, I want to find uh, every everybody who works for a, a manager whose manager has a first name uh, equal uh, I don't know Jean for example I don't know if I if there are some but just uh, an example so if I if I run something like this put a second equal it's better. It's not necessary, but uh, it, it it has found three three or eight entities. There are the the database is only one point five million uh, employees, so it, it's not that big, but it's uh, it, so. And here it has internally done uh, two joins in order to find this. So I, I can prove it. Actually, we will. Put the query settings. So we'll put a, a query plan. True. And at the end, we'll have the result. I don't know. Uh, plan is equal to. Chosen stringify of the query plan. So if I run this and I look at my plan, oh, it's not going to be easy. I should have done an alert. It would have been, let me do an alert. It will be better because. So yeah, it's not easy to see because it's not formatted and so on. Uh, but it, it actually does uh, a, a several level join where it, it actually do a query on the uh, index first name on, on Jean to, to find. Then it, it does a, a, um, a join with the ID of, of uh, that employee with the manager ID. And then it does a join another level and so on. So, yeah, it's not very easy to see. It's not the best. Uh, I should have done a, a, a better hierarchical view of the, the plan, but at least uh, you understand that it internally does the, all of this automatically. So you can use your aliases uh, in a completely transparent way. They will still be optimized the same way as if you were writing your code step by step. Uh, now, more on the extension of the model. I, I talked about uh, computed attributes. So if you look at this, uh, no, classes. for example, for, for my employee entity, I want to be able to so let me open it, that will be easier. Okay. So I have a, a computed attribute full name. I, I want the full name to be the first name plus a space plus the last name. It's a very simple example. It's usually not the way you want to do it, but okay. So I can put uh, an onGet full name uh, function 
that will be automatically be called anytime you need the full name for whatever reason. So if you display it uh, in a form, in a web form, if you, if you use it in, in code and so on, it will be automatically called. Same thing for the, the, the set full name. A computed attribute can be read-only or not, depending on what kind of attribute. And in, in the case of full name, I want to be able to say uh, my employee.fullName is equal to something, and it will automatically convert into first name and last name. So here is the, the get. The get, I, I check if the first name is null, then I only take the last name. If the last name is null, I only take the first name. If both are null, I will get null automatically out of this. And if both of them are not null, then I get first name plus space plus last name. I put that, so I, all, all those events are following the same model. I get an event in the first parameter, and in the result uh, property of my event, I, 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 give, I give the result. So here's the, the result. And same thing for the set. If I put, um, I split my string into uh, two string with the space. And I, I take the first part to, to put it in, into the first name and the second part into the last name. So something very simple. So if I do this in my code, If, if I do something like this, dollar $m uh, is equal to whatever. Uh, and If I run this and I, I look at uh, at m dot full name, it's automatically joins me. So it's it's a computed attribute, and the, the opposite is true. If I, if I do um, something like this, And if I look at my, my employee, the, the first name and last name, uh, well, the first name is automatically set and so on. So you may also have noticed that I entered lowercase and there is automatically an uppercase uh, for the first letter. It has been capitalized. So this is another kind of uh, control you can have of events you can set. If you look at my at my data class uh, at my class employee entity, I put an event on touch. So on touch means that whatever the, the way you modify the value of your attribute, on touch will be called. So it could be while entering uh, data in a form, in a web form, in a in some code, whatever. So here, each time it is touched, I want to call the capitalized function for the first name and something on the last name. Which is true here in on the set full name. Set full name, I, I say first name is equal to the first part of my full name. So it will also automatically call the untouched. So now 
anytime I enter or, or, or set the value of, of, uh, of an employee first name, it will be capitalized automatically. So it, it's, a, it's a cool way to control uh, at a very low level the, the data through your, uh, your code, your business logic. So those, those events work uh, whatever you do. And now I, I have the, the, the full name, okay? But if I want to, to do a query on the full name, doing a query on 1.5 million uh, records would mean, if, if I, I want to look for John Smith, would mean to recompute John Smith for each record and compare the value, I mean, to, to recompute, sorry, the, the full name for each record and compare the value to, to John Smith, which would not be optimized at all. So you have a way to actually control the way the query uh, will, will be analyzed before actually performing the query. You have the onQuery event for a, a computed attribute. And the onQuery is actually not called while you perform the query, but just before when the query is being analyzed to, to build the query plan. And you can decide, so you, you get in the, the onQuery event, you get uh, an event which contains the attribute name, the, the, the computed attribute name, the operator, the comparison operator, so equal, uh, uh, not equal, greater than, and so on, and the value you want to query on. So if, if I were to do a fine employee uh, where full name is equal to John Smith, in my comparison operator, I would get the uh, equal operator, and in my uh, event value, I would get John Smith. So here, here is what I do, and, and sorry, and at the end, you must return a string, which will be a subpart of the query, which will replace your query. So if you do query on, on, on full name equal John Smith, you want to return first name equal John and last name equal uh, Smith. If you want to say uh, full name is not equal to John Smith, you want to say you want to return first name is not equal to John or last name is not equal to, so depending on on, so, so you can return a sub-query, actually, a sub-part of the query. And here, here is exactly what I do. I, I check uh, for the, the value, and uh, if it has at least two, uh, two parts, uh, I do something like this, first name with the operator and the, the first part of the value, and last name, operator, and the last, last part of the value, and so on. If it's null, I, I, I check for empty string, and so on. And you, you, return, you return that substring that will be then repassed by the query analyzer into uh, something that can be further optimized, especially if you have indexed on the first name and last name like I have in my database. So just as an example, let's do it. Using my window, I should put it there so it will be easier to see. Okay, so let's do something like this. Full name. Miss, and I'll do this with uh, a query plan so we can see what's going on. A uh, new object, sorry. Oh, I forgot. Okay, so, oops, sorry, it says something is missing. Okay. 
So if I run this, first, uh, so I don't have any just miss, so it was quite fast, but as you could see, it took one tenth of a second on 1.5 million uh, records, and even though it was a computed attribute. And if you look actually at, at what happened in the query plan, it's easier to see that way. It did uh, first name is, is equal John, last name is, is equal Smith, and it did an end between both of them, uh, and so on. So it's um, it's a, it's a nice way to optimize and, and use computed attributes as if they were uh, built-in attributes at the same speed and, and change your model. So it's also a way to extend or modify your internal data structure without breaking your code because you, you can decide later on to, to use another kind of way to store your internal data and the computed attribute will still behave the same. Uh, and the optimization goes also, if, if, I, if I want to find for everybody working for a manager who is, uh, whose full name is John Smith, then it will perform that query optimization on full name, but based on the relation because you return a, a, a subquery which is fully generic. It, the, the query optimizer goes one cycle further and re-execute. So, same thing here in in one in less than one tenth of a second. On uh, it has done a join where it actually used the computed attribute here in something like this. So sorry, it's not easy to see. I will extend the screen. So it did uh, sem the same thing, on, but on, a, on, a, on an instance of the table called employee one. And then it, it did a join between, um, there it is, on, uh, where is the join? There it is. Yeah. The join is here between the manager ID of employee and the ID of employee one. So you can really use your computed attribute anywhere you could use regular attribute and you will have the same performances as long as you created the nice on query uh, function, the, the, the right on query function. And same thing for sorting. I, I, I don't have much time, so I will go a bit further, uh, uh, faster here. But you can do it on sorting and so on. Uh, um, okay, now uh, I'll just explain one last thing because I will use it again later on. For example, I have a computed attribute on uh, on the edge. Uh, Edge based on, so where is my, comp oh, there it is. So same thing, I, on, on, I have the birth date and I want to compute the edge uh, based on the birth date. So I did something a bit rough where I, I divide by, uh, by the number of, of days in a year uh, plus a quarter because of uh, bisextal uh, years. But it's good enough, it gives good results. It's not always accurate up to the second, but that's fine. And uh, so that's my get edge. And for the query, that's the same thing. I, I want to compute two dates. So it, if somebody is 25, that means that from now on, he was born 25 years earlier. It, it's, it's, a, it's a range of one full year. So there are two limits, the upper limit and lower limit, and, and I can do search on this. So if I, if I do, um, instead of the full name, if I do age uh, equal uh, 35, for example, sorry. So I'm, I'll put 
I'll use the right way to do it because I want it to be a number and not a string. So it has found uh, 40,000 uh, employees out of 1 million and, and a half. And if I look at the, 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 the way the query, oh, sorry, the query plan is there. So it has, it has found people whose birth date is between this and this, uh, which is the, 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 the day of today uh, minus uh, 25 years. OK, so I, I'm a bit late, so I, I'll now switch to the, the web forms. I, I, I spent too much time. There were more. So very, very quickly, one more thing. Oh, sorry on the wrong stuff. Here, I wanted also to explain the ability to extend data classes and, and uh, inherit from data classes. So for example, I have the, the manager. Uh, manager will be a, a, a virtual data class uh, based on employee. Uh, that's it. And I can uh, control the behavior through, through events and methods. If I look here for the manager, I can have an unrestrict uh, function which will control uh, the way uh, you, the, the selection is built. So when you have a, a restriction on a data class, anytime you do a query or if you ask for all entities and so on, it will first go through the restriction and then do the query on the restricted uh, selection. So you, you just have to return a selection, which will be the, the filter. Here, my filter will be the, uh, every employee whose direct report is not null, So, which is a manager is when they have direct report. So automatically, it will restrict on this. So this is a very simple example, but usually, on the web, or uh, if you have ac if you let people have access uh, from different uh, tenants, you could control through uh, a, a session management ID or, or some other data and uh, forbid some uh, data access that way. So it's 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 a very safe way to to control uh, data because. Whatever people try to do uh, in a query, it will first be filtered at a, at a low level, and then the query is executed. I, I don't have time to show, but uh, this is a, a bit of the future. Now I, I'll switch to, to the web because we're a bit late. Um, OK, so first, let me quit this. I'll start with showing. I, I was talking with somebody. We we have um, we have made a, a very simple application for demo, which called for the invoicing app that was done some time ago, and which is fully a client server. Okay, so this is a, an example where you. You, you, you have uh, products for each product. You, you can click and it, see the, the product. You have a picture, some description, and so on. And you can do next, previous, go to the next one. You can, uh, sorry, you can search on some things. For example, if I do a, a Potter, uh, no, there's no anywhere. Starts with in Potter. Okay, so you can do those kind of things, and I wanted to show that we could do the same thing in a, in a web application. So I used. I will show the result first, and then I will explain how we could build all of this. So we have a, a, a builder. And on the product, here is the form. So 
I, I won't go into detail now, and I will execute it. So we have a, about the same thing. I, I didn't do exactly the same colors and so on, but the idea is the same. This is my web where you can, instead of, uh, of one window opening another window, I, I, I did everything in one single uh, stuff, but it could be. So here I can do uh, next, I can uh, search on uh, ink potter and so on. So the, the same thing applies and so on, the, the same function. So now how, uh, how was this built? I will show on another, um, let me quit this. Let me. I, I will come back to this one later at the end, but I want to, to show slowly the, so I'll go back to my end comp. So we have the, this very ugly uh, form, which will not be the final one. I will show you what it will look like right now. But this is where you actually, um, uh, where you actually browse your forms and edit them. So if I, I want to open a form, I, I can see it there and so on. So actually, the, the real one will look like this. It's, um, it's a much better look. It's, not, it's far from being final, but the idea is that you get your classes, your methods, your web forms, and for each web form, you, you can click and edit or on a method. Same thing for the classes for uh, for uh, so you you get basically get the same kind of explorer explorer you get in a client server but on the web and you can edit your code and so on you can uh, uh, close a tab move a tab and, and so on and you can switch uh, you, you you get different things where you can switch between different themes and so on and uh, so. It's a very modern uh, editor that we are building uh, based on this. But it, it's not working. And one thing is, is broken right now. That's why I, I have to do it uh, that way. That What is broken is that when you click on a web form, it doesn't show here. It should, but it doesn't show anymore. So, so this will be fixed, and we'll use it again. So. So from now on, I'll use the old way of, uh, of selecting them through that, uh, that one. So here is a, here is a form. And on, on the form, I, I'll build one very quickly, but just to show very quickly. So you can edit stuff like, for example, if it's, it's a grid, uh, you, you can set your, your stuff. Or if, if, if it's an input, you can select your, your, your style, your, uh, your data access, and so on. So, so let, let's create one that will be easier. So the old way. Uh, this is the, the way you actually call the page one it's, uh, it's built. So. Here, I, I, I get uh, an editor, which is also far from being final, but, uh, but at least a few things. So you get the, the layout part where you can set up things uh, to control the, the flow of, of, uh, of your uh, different widgets and so on. So I, I can do, for example, a, a two colon things where I can choose a colon. And inside my columns, I, I can put, a, I don't know, a, a style box. Um, 
where is my start box? Uh, sorry, I'm a bit lost. Yeah, here it is. Uh, and in that style box, I can do uh, uh, something like uh, changing the color, the background color. It will it will be ugly, but doesn't matter. So no, no, no worries. Okay, and uh, and I can put a, a text input and with some labels or. And so on. So I, I can edit my uh, my form actually. And what's important is that you can have a, a, a relation between your your form and your data through data sources. So in in the data access. So for for example, in my uh, I can put a data source called S, for example, for string. Okay. If I if I if I don't do anything particular on a data source, it will be a string by default. But then I have a, the ability to choose what kind of data source, if it comes from the server, or if it's a local data source, and so on. Uh, I will show all of this. But OK, here's something. And I, ca I, I could do uh, the same thing on, uh, I don't know, another. Uh, it, it won't be very interesting, but I can put another text input here. Uh, and on put the same data source, for example. And if I run this, oh, I forgot to save it. <laughs> Sorry. If I run this, I get my data source where I, I can do, and they're both connected to the same uh, the same data source, so they both share the same value and so on. Not very interesting, so I'll very quickly go to something uh, more interesting. Okay, so in my test, uh, okay. very nice yellow. I forgot I put them, but okay here. It, a slightly more interesting uh, form. Okay, here I have a slider where I, I define the value to be between 0 and 100 on a step of 1. And in my data access, I said it's on the data source n. And if I look at my data sources, I said n to be an, a simple uh, data source, so scalar data source and to be a number, and b to be a Boolean data source. OK, so nothing very fancy here. But so here, here is that ruler connected to n. Now, what I also want to do is that every time I move that slider, so either when I change by clicking or when I change by moving, so on the change or input event. I want to call the method compute square in 4D. I want to pass as a, as a parameter to compute square my, my data source n, which is the content of this. And I want the resulting data source in SQ. And I actually put the resulting data source here sq and here as a reminder i put n to to see when i move here i want to see also the value of n here if i look on so what is important is here i call the method compute square on my server i have that method compute square, which is quite complex. It takes the parameter, uh, which is n in my, in my form, multiply it by itself, and return the result. So if I, if I uh, run this, sorry. Uh, there it is, save modification, and I uh, 
I do something like this. So it, I have the value, and each time 4D is being called and recomputes the, the, the square. So something you could do easily without using 4D, but just to show what you can do. Now, of course, it's more interesting when, when you can link it to, the, to your data and, and in an easy way. So let me close that. And let's start with that, that form. You should forget about that last part. It's, it's supposed to be on the left side, but right now it's not in that part of the editor. So not everything is final. But here's a, here a simple form. What I did is that I created here a, a, a colon component with two. Uh, two columns, so each column has a width of six. So it, it's based on bootstrap, where you actually can have up to 12 uh, columns in your form, and uh, it automatically resize based on the screen size. And if it doesn't fit, it can move on top, on, in, on, in the bottom, on the left, and so on. So you have control about all the, the responsive uh, part. So here, I, I did something simple, two columns. Uh, each of them takes six, six part of the, the columns. And uh, this is a, a, a data grid, a simple data grid, where I want to see from my employee the ID, first name, last name, and salary. So, ah, sorry, I should mention this first. So here, in that one, I have more complex data sources. So I have EMPS, which is an entity selection data source type uh, from the data class employee. Uh, I'm sorry for the small, uh, the small, this should not appear, it should be there only, but there is a small bug in that version, but it makes it more difficult to see. So uh, from employee and with the initial value, if I don't do any query, of all employees. And then I have AMP, which is an entity from AMP, so from that entity selection. And same thing, if I don't do anything, the initial value will be the first uh, entity of the, the selection. So in my data grid here, I said the data source will be AMPs. So it will display my, my selection of employees. And in my uh, current item, so when I click on an item, I want AMP to be the current item, which is an entity, which allows me here to put in my data access AMP.ID or M.firstName and so on. For here, I want to put uh, M dot photo, which is a, a picture of the, the employee. Okay, and so if, if I run this already, if I, if I try this, it will work, and I get my, uh, my employees, and I can click and get the, the picture. So without much code uh, server side, I can already have something working and so on. I could do next first. I could have a predefined button for functions and so on. But now I want to be able to query, to, to save and so on. So to query, I want to be able to query on the first name, for example. If I go back into my form, here is a text input where in my event, so I, I called it pattern. It's a string, and I want for each time I enter a key, so on the input uh, event, uh, I want to call the query by first name method in 4D with the parameter being pattern and with the resulting data source to be amps, which, which will be displayed in my, my data grid. So if I look in, in 4D in, on server side, query by first name, uh, pattern 
is a string, but I, I use the new C variant uh, possibility of 4D just for fun, so it can be any type of value. It was not necessary. So, uh, so the, the parameter $1 is the pattern. It, it, it will be a, a string in that case, but it could be null also. So because it could be null, I check, I use the string function. So if I use the string function of a string, it returns the string itself. If I return it on null, it returns empty string. So that way, it allows me to very quickly check if it's null or empty. Then I select all employee, and I return that as the result of my function. If not, I, I do a query on the first name being equal to the pattern plus the wildcard to, to do a, a begin with. So that's my function, and it returns a selection. That selection will automatically be handled by my web form because in my code here, I said I want the, the result of my function to be in amps. So if I now run this and I enter something like A, it will find all uh, all in place, starting with ABE, ABA, and so on, automatically does the, the, the query, and everything is automatically handled. So it makes it very, very easy to handle a set of data and manipulate a, a set of data that way. So this is a simple data grid. The data grid can be customized in a lot of ways. You can have, instead of uh, paging, you can decide to have... so. I won't go into too many details. It's already a bit late. But uh, let me go back to, okay, here. Sorry, here. Let's close this. And oh, sorry, I opened the same one. Made a mistake. I wanted to open this one. In that example, I want to be able, in, instead of a data grid to, to scroll through my data, I want to be able to, to use uh, my, own, uh, my own form, my own subform, actually. So here, what I do is that I, I create um, a small style box. And Inside that style box, so I have a, a few things like padding and so on to, to, to display the things. Inside that style box, I create here um, a flex, uh, sorry, uh, an another, oh, I clicked on the wrong one, sorry. It's not easy. There it is. Uh, I want uh, a a positioning which will be flex, which means from left to right. Oh, by default, you, you can choose a different kind of positioning, automatic, flex, absolute positioning. Absolute positioning will be useful when converting um, forms which are more like client-server forms into quickly uh, uh, web forms while keeping the, the object at the same position. But it's not recommended if, if you want to do um, uh, something which is flexible, actually, to, to re resize when you change the, the, the size of your screen or if, or, or if you move to a smartphone or a, or a, a tablet and so on. You, you don't want to use absolute positioning, actually. Um, so here, here is my... Uh, my stuff and same thing here in my data sources I have amps and amp the same one uh, as before in my that that form will be used inside uh, a repeater component so that form will be repeated based on my on, an, on a selection so you can repeat information based on a an entity selection or a collection of objects or, or, or whatever, anything that, that is actually a collection that, that, that can be looped through. And so here it's based on amps. 
Same thing, I want the, the element to be displayed here to be AMP. And I want a, a default pagination from the server of 20 by 20. I, I can control the pagination to optimize, so it could be whatever I want and so on. So if, if I run this, let, let me run it so it, it will be easier to, to see. It does something like this. I get my, my subform here, which is repeated with the first name, last name, and photo. If I look the way it was built here, I, in my data access, I do amp that first name, same thing, amp that last name, and uh, amp that photo. Uh, this is repeated. On the other end, I want also to be able, when I click on one, to display it here uh, in a better way. So, in order to do so, I just also have to put in a form here uh, m dot first name the, the same data source, and the the system is clever enough to know that when it in, it is sorry when it is inside a repeater it will use it to repeat the information without changing anything here, and when it, when it's outside it will be the element that is actually selected by the user. So it doesn't make any confusion and it allows you to have the same code and the, the safe, same way of programming and so on. It makes it, makes it easy. When I, when I click on, on, a, on an employee here, I want to, to show the detail, I want the photo, and I want also to, to show uh, some more information. I want to show the direct reports, if it has direct reports, or so it will be a bit difficult to see on that screen. Um, yeah, it will be. Because I, I have another phone, but I, right now the, we cannot scroll uh, inside the, the builder itself, so I'm, I'm a bit limited for my demo. Uh, let me try to reopen it. Okay, here you can see the um, two two different parts. S if I if I click on this one first, oh, sorry, it's difficult to see. Okay, this one I gave it a name called no reports. So that's the one that is hidden now. By, and this one I gave it a name. Sorry, I clicked on the. There it is reports. So that name, that reference, is a server-side reference. So it, it's not useful locally. It is useful when you, from the server, want to control your, your web form. So here is what I want to do. When I, when I have a, a, an, empl an employee, it can be a manager or not. So if it's a manager, I want to display the direct reports here in a, in a small uh, data grid where I, I show the first name and last name of the report. And if it's not, I want to, to say it's not a, a, a manager. So I have two, two different parts and I want to hide one and show the other one uh, depending on what type of, uh, of uh, employee it is. So in my code server side, I have, um, so first, sorry, in, on my data source, based on the ID, uh, sorry, in the data access even. So when the source of, of, uh, of that information, so when the, the source AMP is modified, uh, so it can be modified for any reason, when the user click, when I do a query or whatever. So when the, when the source has changed, when the value of the source has changed, I want to call display reports on the server. And with the resulting data source being S, S is actually uh, here, 
if you look here, S is here. It's a text. It's inside the text as a, a parameter inside my text with two a curly bracket around it, which means uh, replace this by the value of the data source when you display it. So I, I will return S in my display report. So I, if I look back at, uh, at that, it's going to call display report. And server side, here is what display report does. So, sorry forgot to mention that the parameter is actually the employee itself, the, the current employee. So if I look at display reports, server side, the parameter is either an employee or null. It could be null if nothing is selected. So if it's not null, I will get uh, the full name, which is my computed attribute. Okay, So I, I get the full name as the result that will be written into S. And if it has di direct reports, so if the, the selection of direct reports is greater, the, the length is greater than zero, so it means it, it has direct reports, then in the, in the web form, which is a, a, a function of for the server, on the server, which actually controls the web form uh, client side, I want to say that reports uh, uh, the, the, the widget will show. So I, I say web form report show and web form no reports hide. So remember, there were two different um, parts that I called reports and no reports, so I can show them. If, if it's uh, the opposite, then I hide reports and show the no report if it's not uh, a manager. And, and if it's null, I hide both. So when, when you run this, it does something like this, F5, uh, I'll start from scratch. If I, if I click here, this one is a manager, so I show the report and it automatically gives me the, the report. I, I'll show you how, how they were displayed. And if I click on somebody that is not a manager, okay, for example, then it hides the report and show the name is not a manager. So you, you have a, a full control on, on the way your form behaves. Usually you do nicer form than I do because mine is a bit ugly, but at least it gives you an example of what you can do. Uh, let's go back here. So for example, to, to show the, the, the direct reports here, same thing, I, I don't need much coding because AMP is my employee, so I can just use the a data source which will be composite, uh, uh, composed of amp.directreports directly. I have nothing else to do and I, I, and I want the first name and last name to be shown and that's it. So it's, it's very, very easy to, to, to do your stuff. Um, let's go back to uh, here. Same thing like I did for the, my, my previous form, I want to be able to, uh, to show, um, to do a query on the first name. So I did exactly what I did before. I have a pattern and uh, I do a query by first name on this. And the difference, is I want to show the number of, uh, of uh, employee matching my, my query. So I just do amps.length in a text, uh, this is a text uh, to display and so on, without any particular style, but I, I, I could put some style, some color and so on. And if I run this, so if I tap A, B, so you, you, you see, for example, A, B, A, and so on, it's fine. So that, that makes it easy to, so one, more, third part of the demo. Uh, I want also to be able to, to do a query uh, on, on the salary, for example. But instead of, of uh, entering the salary on me, I want also to be able to use a slider. So uh, I have a, a mean value of zero, 
a, a max value of $100,000, which is a lot for a salary per month. No, <laughs> and <laughs> and, uh, and uh, the step. And I, I link this to uh, a data source called Q salary for query salary. And the event will be, it will call query by salary uh, on the input event uh, with the resulting data source being AMPS, so the, the same data source again, and the parameter will be Q salary. And I, I can do the same thing here. I have also in my stuff the Q salary being here. So now if I, and so sorry, should see the query by salary function. Query by salary. Here it is. Uh, so the the parameter is Q, Q salary. So it, it's dollar one. So I do a query on the salary greater than this, and order by salary, and I return this as my selection. That's all I have to do. And uh, if I run this. Sorry. So I now click here and it does a query and order by on the salary and it has found and so on. And, and it's live so I can move like this and, and so on. So it's, uh, it's easy to build your, your, uh, your interface that way. Let me go back to. So I'll go into a bit more details on how it was done. Um, okay, so here is my my form, and I, I'll show you what you can now do on. Uh, I mean, control you get and so on. So you. You, you can take any style box, like, uh, for example, a uh, style box like this, and, and, and set a, a few things. And uh, so, for example, I, I, can, uh, I can do some padding or some, some font. So, for example, I, I'll choose a font like, uh, I don't know, uh, a cursive font uh, with a size of, uh, of 12. And being bold. Okay. So if I now, and if I want, I can save this into a class that to reuse it. So if I like that design, I can reuse it. So I can save it into a class name, I don't know, AAA, for example. Okay. So now, if if I create a text input, ah, I want to put it outside there. And that text input, for example, I can decide to have a label, so my label, label. And I can apply that label on that label for the uh, for the label, I can choose my my class. So automatically, my my label now is so the the, the text is not. Oh yeah, I cannot edit. I'm not using. So if I run this, the text inside it's still, but my label is. So you can really work on sub part of your label, and and uh, and change uh, and. Server side, you can control also. You can choose uh, to to change sub part of your form uh, or, or, or or change uh, some text and so on uh, based on the the class, the CSS class you chose for for your form. So those CSS class are not supposed to be there. They're, they're supposed to be there. You you will have the ability to actually create your own uh, classes there, edit them, and so on. Right now, 
you have to do it that way, but it's, uh, it's only temporary. So you can, uh, so you, ha you have different, different type of, uh, of stuff. You have a checkbox and, and so on, you'll see, uh, and same thing. And all of them can be connected to a data source and so on from the server. You, you have um, a ruler, autocompletes, for example, if I, if I use, uh, if I take that form uh, again, for example, this one. And uh, I could choose. Um, oh, actually, I already did it. Uh, for example, I want um, when I enter something here, I want the autocomplete to come from the m dot first name and the value, the resulting value, to be also a first name. So if I run this. I can type something here, and it it does an autocomplete on the on all the first name in my database. So, without much work, uh, I can do this automatically, and so on. So it, it, it is uh, so there are a lot of um, predefined widgets, and we are building more and more to to actually uh, help building the form. I'll go back to uh, sorry. to my initial demo of the web form. Okay, so here, here is, remember the, the one I showed you, so the, 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 re, the result is there. So while editing, it, it looks a bit different because we, we have the ability to, to actually have margin while editing to, to actually differentiate the different subpart. But there is also a possibility to, to disable those margins so that you edit in a more uh, WYSIWYG way. Right now, the disabling of the margin is broken, so I cannot <laughs> disable it. So that's why it's a bit difficult to, to, to show things. Uh, things are a bit cumbersome. But So for example, when I, uh, next, uh, on the next button, it's a, a predefined action called next entity. On, on my data source, the data source is amp, of course. Uh, sorry, it's product here. In that case, it's product. So uh, I should go first to the. So I have products, which is an entity selection on the data class product. Product, which is an entity in product. I have the query string, which is a simple uh, string, and optional data, which is an array. Uh, so why why do I have the optional data? The way the 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 code was written in 4D for the, the client server uh, version of that application was that actually here in the... Um, sorry. Here, this part is, a, is a, a, a list box based on a, a collection of properties which comes from a simple object which is stored inside the, the record. Uh, and there is some actually complex code which goes over all properties and reorder them in a, in a linear way to, to display them in a list box. So that code was already written. It was server-side. So the good part is that I didn't have to rewrite that code. I just have to use it. Uh, and if I look at, at uh, how it was done here, optional data is so a data source of data. Of data, as I said, is an array. And if I look at, at my um, at my uh, sorry, 
data source. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit confused. In the, I have, oh, sorry, the, the, on my data source, I have uh, each time the, 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 the source changes, so the, the product is different. Uh, I will call the get optional data method from uh, in, in 4D with the resulting being in up data and based on product being the, the element I'm, I'm working on. So get optional data, server side is there. It's a bit bigger because get optional data is there. Uh, so product is my, my parameter, so it's the entity I'm working on. So if it's null, then I return an empty collection. If it's not null, I use that method that was already written to convert the uh, optional data object uh, attribute in my product into a collection. So I, I can show you what it does. It does a lot of things. It doesn't matter. But the good thing is that I didn't have to rewrite it. It was already there in client server. I just reuse it in my form. I return an, an array, so a collection, actually, which is in JavaScript a, an array of, of objects. And then in my form, automatically up data is there and I, I will use the property and value of, of, uh, of that array to, to display that information. Um, so it is, it is quite easy to take an existing application and uh, so, so next, previous and so on. Same thing uh, in, in that, um, sorry, let me go back there. If you look at, at the form add buttons, for example. So, um, uh, there it is. So, for example, here's the, the next button. Next button is, if you look at it, it's, it's based on buttons, product, next button, PNG. It's a PNG which has four states. And uh, if you know those buttons, you have the, the, the enable state, Sorry, disable state, uh, I'll, uh, uh, over state, and so on, so uh, and so on, and uh, they have a, a size and so. On. So, in our web form, we are able to use the same kind of of, of object. So, if I look at, at this here, I, I said it's um, it's a button using the button uh, product uh, next. Dot .png, so the same PNG, a PNG, and it's a composite picture with 24 by 24 uh, width for each. And that's it, it will automatically uh, understand the content of the picture. So if, if I actually look at, 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 the, at this, no, it's not in this one, it's in product, invoice demo. Uh, it's in web folder uh, buttons. Yeah, here here are my, my buttons. That 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 comes from the the existing uh, database automatically. So I can reuse them, and they will automatically work. So if I if I click on it, it it follows the rule. You can see that it's highlighted and, and so on. If I, it's not very easy, but uh, and so on. So you, you, you can reuse the easily the, the code. And now one more thing on, uh, sorry, it's not, uh, in, in, my, in my form, uh, I, I decided to have some uh, limits for my, so I, I, I can choose to, automatically regrow or, or, or move um, things on the bottom if it's too small. So if I, if I run, if I resize this window, so it, it resizes, you can see that the, the columns resize, this resizes and so on. And, and 
if I resize a lot, sorry, too fast, you, you can see that now it moves uh, uh, okay. because based on some uh, size, uh, if it's too small, I can choose to automatically and so on. So it makes it easy for different screen size and, and so on. It's not the best, uh, best form I ever did, but uh, <laughs> it's, I, I tried to match the, the 4D forms the way it was done. Uh, and I'll now talk about the session management. Uh, still, yeah, I still have plenty of time now. Uh, cool. um, so I need to, it's in the order. So, in the um, server side, you, you have a lot of control. You, you have a new, um, new uh, commands and new objects, new classes, actually, to control uh, your form. So, you have the web form object, which is the web form you're currently working on. It's, it's based on, internally, the web form class, which has properties and each property is one of the components of your web form. So you can control each component server side. You can hide, show, uh, change the, the class, uh, the, the CSS class. Uh, uh, so for example, you could, you could have a CSS class which is red when something is wrong and green when it's not. And depending on some error on the server, change the, the, the CSS class on, on the form. Uh, so you have a lot of control that way. But you, you also have a, a new object, which is called the session. And the session actually is there. Let, let me show an example. So yeah. here's the, the, the session object. The session object has several properties. So what is the session object? The session object is an object that is automatically uh, created uh, when you connect uh, from your, your web uh, browser or your mobile uh, to to the, the, the uh, a 4D web form. Automatically, you, you get your session. Actually, it's not for web form only, it's for any web connection. Now, you, you have the ability to have this for any web connection. So you have your, your session object, and that session object contains different information, like uh, the authentication, so you can uh, log in or, uh, or not. And it contains a uh, a set of privileges you can give to your application. Um, so you, you define roles uh, which are whatever you want. For example, you can define a role like uh, access to, to that particular table. Okay, so you, you create a role A and in a session you say, okay, for that particular session, I grant the role A and C and D, for example. And, and then, during the whole life of your session, those roles will apply. So, a role can be a restricted access to uh, a particular table or an attribute or the execution of a method or a group of, of that. Inside a role, you can put a lot of, of things. You can say, okay, that table, that table, and that table go into that role. Or a role can also contain sub-roles. So once you, you have defined your set of, of roles, they're completely independent of users or group in an organization, their, their roles. And 
it's only the session that is the link between users and roles and privileges, actually. Uh, so um, once you, you log in, you, you choose your, the way you log in. The, the, there's no particular way of logging. It could be through uh, uh, Google o -O Auth, or it could be through a simple uh, dialogue where you enter a, a name or a, a mail or a password, whatever. But you, you also have, so you have a function to say, I want to control the way I log in you. You, you have a function to say, okay, now I grant the login access to, to a particular uh, session. Yeah, it's a bit complex, sorry. I, 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 should, I, I don't have any demo here because I didn't have time to prepare a demo. Th this part is, has been done lately, but Let's take an example. Let's take an example that will be easier because I'm, I'm, I think I, I, I get you confused. But you want to authentic, authentic, authenticate through uh, Google or OS. Um, so you will um, do the authentication using the, the, the Google uh, web sub, sub, sub web page. I mean, the it gives you a, a token, you, you keep that authentication token, you, you, you check if it's valid or not. And once you know the authentication has been completed, it, it is right, then for your current session, which by default is not authenticated, so by default you get a session which has the minimum privileges which depends on, on what you chose as the minimum privilege, but by default it has, then you, you can say, you can say login accepted. Uh, it's actually accept login on your session. And when you accept the login, you, you, you give a, a list of privileges here. So those privileges, is, it's actually a collection of, of, um, of strings, which are the name of the, the roles you defined, so the, and that you defined somewhere else. Okay? So you, you accept the login with those privileges. So after that call, your session can then access to some of the resources that were locked because they had some privileges if you have the, the right privileges. So it's very simple to actually completely separate the user login from the, the session itself. In the, in the session, you get much more. You, so you, you get control access and so on, but you get also um, some data that is automatically saved for you. So in the session, you get this session storage and session storage is a shared object uh, that can be used by any uh, process uh, using your session uh, so why why is it shared and why several processes so when you're in the on your web form or, or, or in the browser you can click on a button that will send a request then it will run in one process on your server. But at the same time, that process may take some time. It may take uh, a few seconds or, and so on. At the same time, the user may click on something else that will call another process, uh, another button, or, or just redraw. For example, you need to redraw the screen, and by redrawing, it needs to fetch some data, which use a computed attribute that needs to do some computation. There, there may be southern of reason why another process runs one, while one is running. So that process will run with the same session because there, it comes from the same brother page. And so the, if it wants to access the storage, that storage needs to be shared between the different processes uh, using the same session. 
inside that storage, you can store anything you want, like you would do with the, the storage of the server that is shared among all processes of the server. The only thing is that here, it will be linked to your session. When your session dies, that storage dies. And unless you save it, of course, you have, you have a way to save it, to re reuse it. But if you don't, it will, uh, it will be deleted when your session is, is deleted. And, uh, and the good thing is that it, it is automatically handled for you by, the, by a set of cookies, actually, uh, exchanged between the, the, the web browser and the, the server. So you don't have to, to do more than just use your session storage to store anything you want. You can store uh, uh, stats for things. You can store... Uh, uh, I don't know if if you if you do a, a site where you you have to enter uh, things to to keep them uh, and reuse them later on, like uh, like a, a panel of information or, or so on, you you can store them in your in your storage. Um, that's about it. So for the session, I, I'm sorry I cannot show you right now because uh, I I didn't. Uh, it, it takes a bit of time to to built a few things and the session was working and not working again because we internally changed the, the, the way it's, it's handled and it's again working but I, I didn't do any anything to, to show it actually. Actually I could I could quickly in, in a few seconds I could do the, the session storage for example to, to save uh, for example, we, we could imagine that in our web form, uh, yes, we, we can imagine something like this. Um, I don't have any idea. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, by default, uh, it's difficult to come with an idea. So for 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 example um I could um I could have a text input here uh, in that text input, um, I will put a, a, a data source called uh, attribute name, which will be a string. And <coughs> when on the on the change event of uh, the attribute to query, I will uh, call a method uh, change attribute. Sorry, I made a mistake. Okay, change attribute on server side with the, um, the parameter being uh, attribute name. Okay, so now Server side, I will so I'll save this. Server side, I will create that method. And I will do the following this thing, sorry, use session storage. In my session storage, I will check if um, default attribute. Uh, so this is a name I, I choose uh, randomly. Uh, is equal to null. So if it did not exist yet, then I will do something else. I will do something else. So. So if it 
if it did not exist, I will uh, create it. I will say uh, to uh, new new shared object. Uh, with uh, attribute name being equal to dollar one, so the parameter is being sent. Remember, in my code, uh, in the web form, I said I want to call change attribute change at with attribute name. So it's dollar one. So I'll put it in a property in my shared object, and else uh, I will use it. And I will change it. Okay, so simple stuff. And now I want to use that default uh, default attribute. So I, I want to use this actually. So in my query by first name and where is it uh, where did I put that uh, I'll do something like this instead of doing the the query by first name I'll modify my code I keep the old code in case I made I do a mistake. <laughs> okay. And here here is what I want to do. If so if the session store at attribute name is is uh, um, equal no. So if it's null, I, I'll just say that dollar attribute is equal to first name, which will be my default default. Else is equal to this. And here in my query, instead of doing a query on the um, and, uh, sorry. I will do a query on two is equal to dollar attribute. So I, instead of doing the query on the first name, it will do the query on whatever I chose as, as a default. So. so this is live, it may not work, so we'll see. Uh, I like taking risks, so let's try this. Uh, did I save? No, did I save? So le let's run this. Uh, where's the run? There it is. So let's do the query instead of doing on the uh, first name, we'll do it on the last name, and we'll do A, and now it should work. You see, it does the, the query on the, on the last name. And the good thing is that if I start a new, uh, a, a new window based on an old, uh, for example, if I, if, I, if I run on this one, the, the first one, in a new window, if I do here again, it also works based on the. 
because the session now contains in my storage the default value. So I, I can redo that. If I start from another uh, browser, which will be a different session, so let, do I have another browser here? Could, I don't have another computer, but maybe I have Edge. How about Edge is Firefox, maybe? Oh, I, I, yeah, I know what I can do. I can start from Chrome with um, uh, a private session. So it will be a, a, a different session. So I do the same thing again. And I take uh, this one again. So if I do it works on the first name because it's a different session. So the default is the, the first name and so on. So uh, as you can see, the, so it's a very, very, very short example of the session, but the, the session object is very powerful and allows you to keep information and, and control uh, access uh, in a very easy way server side. And you, you, you also have, um, another um, object server side, which is called web event. So as I mentioned, when you, when you are being called inside your, um, inside your uh, 4D method like here, at any time, you can use the web event uh, function. And the web event gives you which um, event was generated by the user in the browser to actually call your method. So it could be a, a click, an input, a change in a, in a text input. It could be a, 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 a resize of the window, a redraw, whatever. So you, you have control of the web event, which allows you to modify your code to actually do some specific things based on uh, on that web event. Uh, you, you may not want to behave the same if, it, and also, sorry, the web event also contains the the name of the caller, so the which widget called you, which is very useful if you want to have some very generic code, and depending of the caller, do something slightly different. I'm, I'm sorry, I was a bit confused at the end on the, on the session because it's quite new and not everything was fully tested. But uh, uh, I want to thank you all uh, for, for, that, for the time you, you spent with me and I, and I hope you, you enjoyed. Uh, thank you. Um.